Absorption refrigeration. Can anything on a motorhome be harder to understand than how an RV refrigerator actually works? Even though the theory of absorption might be difficult to comprehend, all coach owners with an RV refrigerator must understand a few key factors regarding this type of refrigeration. The main component on an RV refrigerator and the focus of this presentation is the cooling unit, which in most cases is only partially visible through the lower access door on the exterior of the coach. And rather than bore you with the discussion of the second law of thermodynamics, or Dalton's law of partial pressures, or the latent heat of vaporization and condensation, in this episode, I'll just cover a quick overview of the process, but more importantly, what we as coach owners can do to safely and effectively take advantage of the absorption principle. We'll talk about what can damage a cooling unit, along with some preventive maintenance tasks we can perform. With no moving parts, the absorption refrigerator simply uses a sealed, pressurized piping system containing three main substances, ammonia, water, and hydrogen. A fourth, sodium chromate, which we'll talk about later, is used to protect the internal piping from the corrosiveness of the ammonia. A source of heat is required, and in the RV realm we use three sources, 12 volt DC and 120 volt AC in the form of heating elements, plus a propane burner is ignited. There are two main points to remember about the cooling unit, its levelness and the proper flow of ventilated air. Both are crucial to the successful operation of the RV refrigerator. There are other factors, of course, but from a user's perspective, these are the two most important. But before we delve too deeply into those, let's take a brief look at how the RV absorption refrigerator actually works. The cooling unit is comprised of four major sections. The boiler or generator, it's right here on this diagram. It's actually buried inside a metal enclosure filled with insulation on a completed refrigerator. The next major component is the condenser, here on the diagram and here on an installed cooling unit. Another is the absorber. The coils positioned here on the chart and here on the cooling unit. This tank-like component is the absorber vessel or leveling chamber. The evaporator, right here on the diagram, is not readily visible on an installed refrigerator since it's buried inside a block of insulating foam. In fact, there are two. The low temperature evaporator is in the freezer section, and the high temperature evaporator is positioned in the main refrigerator compartment. On this older cooling unit, the low temp evaporator is this back and forth tube you see here, which projects out horizontally in the freezer. And the high temperature evaporator is right here. You can see it partially buried in the foam block. The high temp evaporator on a completed refrigerator is usually located directly behind the fins seen inside the refrigerator. The interesting thing about absorption piping within the cooling unit is that there's a bunch of pipes within pipes. It's not just simple tubes running from point A to point B, as you can see in these cutaway sections. Here's a cutaway of an absorption refrigerator boiler section. Notice how this smaller blue tube is positioned inside the outer boiler tube section. This is the siphon tube or percolator tube where the ammonia and water are heated by either the burner flame or an electric heating element. The red pipes you see here are the pockets or sleeves for the heating elements. The green pipe is the burner flue pipe. The actual burner would be positioned here, directly below the flue pipe. As the ammonia and water begin to boil, bubbles of ammonia gas are produced, which rise into the percolator tube along with an accumulation of weak ammonia and water. As it rises, it continues into a subcomponent called the water separator. Also called the rectifier, here on this cooling unit, it's represented by these little dimples in the piping. Water vapor reaching this point is simply condensed and falls back into the boiler section, thereby leaving pure, dry ammonia vapor to pass to the condenser. 
The condenser is the uppermost portion of the cooling unit. Here it is on the diagram, and here it is on an actual cooling unit. These fins help cool the ammonia vapor, allowing it to condense back into a liquid as it flows into the upper evaporator in the freezer section of the refrigerator. In the evaporator, hydrogen gas is introduced to the liquid ammonia. A weaker ammonia solution then flows downward into the lower evaporator in the main food compartment. And that's why it doesn't get as cold in the bottom compartment as it does in the freezer. Simply, the ammonia solution isn't as strong. As the hydrogen gas enters the evaporator, it lowers the pressure of the ammonia, thereby lowering its boiling point, which is much colder than the inside of the refrigerator. And this is where the magic happens. As the ammonia evaporates, heat is transferred from inside the refrigerator, including from the food, through the cooler liquid ammonia, and released to the rear of the refrigerator. Remember, you can't make cold, but you can move or remove heat. The solution then continues its downward flow through the absorber and ultimately to the absorber vessel you see here. Upon entering the upper portion of the absorber, a continuous trickle of weak ammonia solution comes into contact with a mixture of ammonia and hydrogen gas, which readily absorbs or dissolves the ammonia from the mixture while freeing the hydrogen and allowing it to rise back through the absorber coil and to the evaporator section. The hydrogen effectively moves back and forth between the absorber and the evaporator sections. This rejected and transferred heat, as well as heat generated by the heating source, must be evacuated in order for the cooling unit to cool properly. The strong ammonia solution produced in the absorber then flows down to the absorber vessel where it's held, mixed with water, and fed into the boiler section, and the process starts all over again. So there you go. Don't worry, there won't be a test. The main objective of this presentation is to help you understand the importance of venting and leveling of the absorption refrigerator. Here's why. From the point where the ammonia vapor is first condensed into a liquid here in the condenser, the only motivating force is gravity. Remember, there's no compressor or pump. For it to flow, mix, and absorb properly, the evaporator section must be relatively level. Running off level causes an inordinate amount of heat buildup in the boiler, and overheating can cause the sodium chromate inside the pipes to crystallize. As mentioned earlier, the sodium chromate is necessary to protect the pipes against the corrosiveness of the ammonia. Remember that percolator tube I showed earlier? Here it is again. Notice how small the tube actually is. As sodium chromate hardens, it can easily block this perk tube. You've probably heard of the term or maybe even experienced having a blocked cooling unit. This is what a blocked cooling unit looks like. This percolator tube inside the boiler section was overheated and the sodium chromate crystallized and literally blocked the flow of the rich ammonia solution boiling upwards towards the condenser. Here's a photo of another blocked percolator tube. Contrary to what some might declare, once solidified, there's no way to dissolve or remove this blockage of crystallized sodium chromate. The cooling unit must be replaced. Very expensive. Another cooling unit failure that mandates a replacement is a leaker. A leaker simply means there's a breach somewhere in the tubing. If the broken tube is exposed, it will exhibit a yellow residue like this, along with a strong ammonia odor. Most leaks, however, occur inside the foam that surrounds the evaporator coils. While condensing vapor into a liquid, moisture forms on the tubing, and because the insulating foam prohibits it from being evaporated, it becomes trapped. A rust pocket develops and eventually a leak or a crack appears. The hydrogen inside is pressurized over 300 psi, so any small rusted area is likely to rupture at some point. If you ever smell ammonia inside or at the rear of the refrigerator, immediately shut it off and open all the windows in the coach and call your local certified technician. It's time for a new cooling unit. Remember also, the refrigerator needs a chimney effect that draws in cool air at the lower refrigerator vent and using convection propels it up the back of the cooling unit and out of the upper vent.
The greater the difference between the removed or rejected heat and the intake air at the lower vent, the stronger the draft will be. This is called thermosiphoning. Unfortunately, the thermosiphoning effect can be attenuated somewhat when the refrigerator is mounted in a slide out. With no roof vent, the heated air must be horizontally forced out of an upper side vent instead of through the roof. Manufacturers install a baffle setup behind and at the top of the cooling unit to divert the heated air out of this upper side vent. Some do it better than others. A good installation encourages as much air as possible to flow through the cooling unit. The chimney compartment should be sealed off completely from the interior of the coach, and aftermarket fans can be added to those units that do not appear to have good ventilation. The bottom line is this, the more heat given up to the exterior of the RV in the fastest amount of time, the better the overall cooling performance. If possible, check to make sure critters or leaves have not blocked the roof vent screen. You may have to remove the lid of the vent, but it's not uncommon for birds to build nests above that nice warm flue pipe. So what else can we do to help the absorption process in an RV refrigerator? I recommend owners perform a run test before loading it up with food. It takes about 24 hours to run the test, but here's how it's done. First, be sure the refrigerator is level. Plug the coach into shore power, turn on the AC heat source, and set the thermostat or thermistor to the coldest setting. Using water to simulate the food storage, pour one or two quarts of tap water in an open bowl and place it in the lower food compartment, along with an accurate thermometer inserted in the water. Allow the refrigerator to run on AC electric for about 24 hours, then check the thermometer. It should measure 43 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. If so, the refrigerator can now be loaded with food and beverages. It's good to go. Just don't block the normal flow of convection air inside. Also, if the test is performed on a very hot or humid day, the measured temperature might register a little bit higher. When operating while sitting still, be sure the refrigerator is level, regardless of the energy source chosen. Periodically check the door gaskets by inserting a business card or a dollar bill around the seals. It should offer a little resistance when pulled out. Keep the cooling unit clean. Periodically wipe down all the exposed tubing of the cooling unit that you can reach. Keep the area around the burner clean and free from critters, dust, and debris. Think this one needs attention? In fact, keep all critters out of the compartment behind the cooling unit. Periodically have the burner flue and flue baffle cleaned, the heating element resistance or amperage draw measured, and the propane pressure regulator checked at least annually. If not protected by a patio awning, try to position the coach with the refrigerator on the shadiest side during the heat of the day. Well, there you have it, a brief overview of how the RV absorption refrigerator operates and what we can do to protect it and get the most out of it. Despite the popularity of the concept of all-electric coaches equipped with residential style refrigerators, I maintain RV absorption refrigeration will still be around a while longer. So on behalf of FMCA, thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next episode of Motorhome House Calls.